Good morning and a very warm welcome on behalf of FPO to this online debate on how can we close the east-west healthcare investment gap in Europe. My name is Jackie Davis. I will have the privilege of moderating this discussion this morning and we're going to have an interactive debate after a couple of short context setters to set out the scale of the challenge and why it is so important to address this issue. Housekeeping before we start, uh, I will have some questions for our panel later on. I'll introduce to them to you later. Uh, if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button, not the chat button, the Q&A button, and write your question in. And could I ask you please to be brief so I can see at a glance what you want to know and who you want to ask your question to. If you want to speak, you can click on the raised hands button and I will allow you to talk when the time comes. I won't ask you to activate your camera. If you're having IT issues, use the chat button and one of our marvelous team behind the scenes will try to help you. If you would like to tweet out about what you are hearing in this discussion, and we do encourage you to do so, please use the FBI hashtag questions inspire solutions. And lastly, just so you know, this event is being recorded. So as we will hear in a moment uh, from a study developed by FPA and PwC, there's a huge gap in average public spending per capita, Central Eastern Europe uh, and the EU's biggest member states. So what reforms are needed if the countries of Central and Eastern Europe are to meet future healthcare challenges and be financially sustainable over the longer term. That's what we're here to talk about. For an introduction to the topic, delighted to welcome Eugene von, R von Rensberg, who is Head of Developed Markets, Commercial Operations, EMEA, at Astellas Pharma. Uh, Eugene, very good to have you with us. Over to you for some opening thoughts. Thank you, Jackie. First of all, thank you for being here, everybody. I hope you all had a good weekend. My name is Eugene van Rensburg. Um, as Jackie mentioned, I'm from Astellas Pharma, a commercial operations in Europe. I'm also a member of the FBIC task force, the Central Eastern European Task Force. And I've spent a considerable amount of time working in Central Eastern Europe region, and uh, I've got a big passion for people and the patients, of course. I want to congratulate PwC and FBIA for this partnership and this great work they've done in pulling this report together. Um, you know, it really has some compelling data and uh, providing some really good insights uh, for us. Um, you know, if you look at the IMF statistical data, only approximately 18 nations in the world are part of the advanced class. You know, since the end of World War II, Southern Europe came first to this advanced class. Then we had East Asia and today Eastern Europe. However, in the CEE region, the mortality rates are twice than those in the EU5, and investments in healthcare is lower than the rest of Europe. You know, if you look at the percentage of GDP in healthcare, CEE is about 3% uh, below the average uh, EU5. You know, for example, one data point from the PwC report that really struck me was that if you look at Germany in terms of GDP percentage investment in healthcare, it's about 11.5%. If you look at their neighbor, Poland, it's only approximately just over 6%, so almost half of Germany. You know, health is wealth, as you all know. And I think those aren't weak words. And if you look at just COVID-19 and the emphasis that has put on, I think it's clear on how that has impacted economies across the world. Another interesting thing that this report shows for me is that, you know, the investment in innovative therapies really help to drive savings, direct savings by lowering healthcare costs. For example, in oncology, you know, if you look at Slovenia, 85% of the increase investment in drug spending and innovative technologies has really helped to directly offset the cost in, a, in a hospital expenditure, for example. Again, health is wealth. You know, so, you know, the, the other thing I think that's important to, to note is that, you know, the prevalence of chronic disease is increasing in the CEE region. You know, so that is affecting the aging, skilled and educated workforce. As a result, people stop working. And therefore, this less tax revenues and increase in health expenditure costs, not to mention the increase uh, in difficulties, of course, and suffering for patients and their families. So like Jackie said, what concrete next steps can be implemented to help us to change this? You know, I personally hope this event is not the last but the beginning of a discussion together with all the multi-stakeholders within the health sector. 
to see how can we address, come up with possible solutions to help drive value for patients in the CE region. I really look forward to this discussion and uh, your insights to share. Thank you for your attention. Jackie, back to you. Thank you very much, Eugene. And Eugene will be joining our panel shortly. And as you say, the start of a conversation, not the end of one. But thank you. And underlining there just how important this issue is and why it matters so much to get it right. You've heard already compelling data and insights. Let's get some of that data, some of those insights. Delighted to welcome Nick Meadows, uh, who is a director of PwC, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the study. And Nick too will join the panel afterwards. So if you have any questions about the study, you can ask them then. Nick, over to you. Thanks very much, Jackie. Um, and, and thank you very, everyone for having me today on, on this uh, panel and on this extremely inter uh, interesting discussion. Look, I, I want to start off by saying it's been an absolute privilege, privilege to be part of the PwC team and the FPA collaboration in developing this report. Um, and, and it dives deep into an, an area that I'm extremely passionate about in terms of raising awareness in the debate around increasing investment in healthcare and the benefits that come from that, not just in terms of health outcomes, but in terms of economic prosperity. Um, I want to thank not just the FBA team in terms of their input and challenge into making this narrative and report as strong as it can possibly be, but all the experts that provided input into the report. Um, we did an extensive literature review, but also engaged over 30 experts across the region through one-to-one -one interviews and several uh, webinars and panels, which I think uh, not only brought in the data point of view in terms of the historical analysis through databases like OECD and WHO, but also on the ground informed experience-based insights into what are the benefits, what are the challenges in terms of increasing investment in healthcare in Central and Eastern European countries. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen so that we can go through some of the high level messages from the report. I won't intend to uh, attempt to present uh, all of the the data is a large and extensive analysis. So I wanna go through the high level um, storyline and structure of the report so that in your own time, you can review those key pieces of data uh, and navigate this report um, efficiently. Um, but the, essentially our report is structured across four key themes um, and sections of the report. We first of all established the point that Central and Eastern Europeans invest less in healthcare per, um, as a percentage of GDP than the five strongest economies in, in Europe. And at this point, this was including the UK. Um, and, and Eugene already referenced the fact that um, the, the EU five economies are investing as much as 5%, um, sorry, it's 10% of their um, GDP into healthcare, whereas the, the average for Central and Eastern European countries hovers around 5%. Um, so there's a huge gap and, and the consequences of that are explored in this report. Um, we show that within lower spending, there is also significantly lower spending on pharmaceutical medicines. And we work extensively to develop a true picture of the difference in spending on pharmaceutical um, innovative medicines um, between the EU5 and Central and Eastern European countries. Um, and we explore the, the, the linkage between lower spending and health outcomes. And it is clear that countries who spend less on healthcare have poor health outcomes. Now, the important thing as we further then explore in the next section of the report is that countries that have poorer health outcomes actually have poorer economic performance um, and lack that fiscal sustainability. And I'm going to talk to you through in the next slide some of the reasons for that, but there's a there really is a causality between investment in healthcare and economic um, prosperity, which is one of the really important parts of this, that the argument for increasing healthcare investment doesn't stop at health outcomes, but goes on to be um, about economic and fiscal sustainability. We look at how CE healthcare systems will need even further investment in the future for a number of different reasons, which are probably familiar with many people today in terms of the aging populations the increasing prevalence of chronic conditions. So without even thinking about trying to catch up with EU5 countries, there's an in, a imperative to increase spending to catch up, to keep pace with the existing challenges that these healthcare systems are going to face in the future. In many of our conversations, um, 
the topic of efficiency and effectiveness of healthcare spending was raised. We took a deliberate decision um, in collaboration with FBA to focus on the argument for increased healthcare investment. There've been many arguments made for increasing efficiency and effectiveness in healthcare spending, not just in Central and Eastern European countries, but in countries all around the world, especially when it comes to making trade-offs between budgets across um, in government budgets and, and the pushback on the ask for more spending on healthcare is to be more efficient and effective at that spend before we can endorse increasing spending. Now that's a really sort of, we acknowledge that and we go into different ways that efficiency and effectiveness can be achieved, but equally we would strongly argue that and encourage that that argument is not used to prohibit increasing spending in healthcare and investment. Both of these things need to be treated, increasing investment, but also achieving better efficiency and effectiveness. And we look at different ways to achieve efficiency and effectiveness. Um, we, you can't have a conversation in today's um, age without talking about the impact of COVID. A lot of the data analysis was done before, um, the, the data that we were using was collected obviously before the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so what you'll see here is a trend that does not take that into account. However, we do go into the report in some ways looking at um, what has been published around the resilience of healthcare systems both before and after COVID-19. And there's been a real correlation around the impact of COVID-19 and the resilience of those countries that have done better or worse in terms of several statistics around COVID-19. And it's clear that those countries that invested more historically in COVID-19 were more prepared and more resilient within that COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and that's the case equally in Central and Eastern European countries. Briefly um, now, if you uh, would, Nick. Hmm? Uh, briefly as possible now, if you would. Yep. Lastly, I just want to show the, the sort of the, the, the causality between health spending and economic prosperity. Increasing spending in healthcare and efficiency reduces frequency of illness and rates of disability. It increases human capital, reduce sick leave, absenteeism and early retirement. This in turn increases your labor supply and productivity, which leads to higher tax receipts. And that's the linkage between spending on healthcare investment and economic prosperity and the linkage with health outcomes in between. You also have reduced need for medical treatment and social costs and lower health and social care costs. And these lead to lower health and social care spending. So in the end, what you have is higher tax receipts, less costs to your health system, which leads to better long-term fiscal sustainability and a better GDP outcome. And this is what we're, the, the argument we're presenting here is that healthcare is an investment, not a cost to the system. And we encourage you all to engage in the report and engage in the debate and the dialogue around this topic. And I think the more we can talk about it, and the more we can recognize the advantages of increasing investment in healthcare, the better we'll be as a society. So uh, thank you everyone and uh, looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Nick, and lots of rich material uh, to delve into. That gives you a, a glance uh, at it, but we will also talk in more detail with our panel about it. We have Nick with us. Eugene will rejoin us, and I'm also delighted to welcome Dr. Stanimir Hazajev, who is co-founder and current chairperson of the Bulgarian National Patients Organization, MPO, and Dr. Johannes Lubkin, who is Principal Advisor in the Recovery and Resilience Task Force, Recover. Uh, he's part of the European Semester Coordination Team at the European Commission. Very warm welcome uh, to Johannes as well, if you can activate your camera so we can see you. Lovely. So let us dive straight in. And I'd like to come to our two new speakers, to Stanimir and to Johannes first, just in terms of a, a first reaction uh, to the headline findings of the report and how you see the challenge, because uh, Eugene said at the end of his opening intervention, what concrete steps do we need to implement? We'll come back to that later. What's the challenge, Stanimir? Well, I, I think the report uh, very well acknowledges many of the problems of the region and outlines the way forward. But I think the biggest challenges in front of Central and Eastern Europe would remain the lack of know-how and expertise uh, in the CE governments and the instability of those governments. Also, uh, the public administration is not prepared enough to uh, conduct the reforms, and we see this during the COVID. And secondly, 
which is uh, even more important, the lack of EU coordination and EU solidarity in healthcare, which is a major driver uh, for many of the countries uh, in, in CE. And here I see lots of weaknesses and area of improvement. Thank you very much. And interesting uh, to discuss later on that lack of know-how and expertise. Does it extend to not really understanding those links that Nick was making earlier? But let's complete the picture, Johannes, uh, in terms of from your perspective, from an EU perspective. We are, of course, comparing uh, the strongest economies. Uh, the big EU5, uh, or now EU4, but it did include the UK, uh, with Central and Eastern Europe. But nevertheless, it's showing just how wide this gap is. And Eugene pointed there to, to one of the statistics, mortality rates two times more than in the EU5. What's your reaction to the findings of this report and what you see as the biggest challenge? Oh, thanks very much. And thanks very much also for organizing this event. It's really a pleasure to be here. And, and I see, I mean, looking at the report, I, I think we have uh, yeah. a lot in common in terms of objectives in, in making um, healthcare really um, uh, higher quality, better accessibility, uh, but also, and Nick, I'm very grateful for you that you, that you mentioned that at the end, um, really looking into efficiency and effectiveness of healthcare. And of course, we are not, I mean, um, we are looking at all the member states uh, uh, we are not looking as such at any divide between between the Central and Eastern European member states and, and the, the EU4 uh, now, but what we are looking at under the European semester, um, what we have done there are country specific recommendations and looking at healthcare. And in the 2019 cycle, we had um, over half of the member states, 15 member states had gotten country specific recommendations in healthcare. In 2020, um, we had really for all 27 member states country specific recommendation, and that was, of course, already due to the pandemic. Uh, and there you see that um, that really the pandemic has has shown the weaknesses of, of all the member states, uh, the structural weaknesses of the healthcare system. And I mean, the coming now to the to the recovery and resilience facility um, health. Healthcare is really one of the main issues which are being tackled under the recovery and resilience facilities. It's part of one of the of the six pillars. And uh, given that that um, it's about the recovery after the pandemic, it has also been a very very strong focus of the of the various member states. Um, uh, just to very very high level to give a flavor of of what is being addressed. This is on the one hand. Um, uh, the the uh, resilience, which is the overall theme of the recovery and resilience facility, therefore strengthening of primary care, shift to outpatient care, accessibility of healthcare for everybody, uh, capacity of healthcare, and then also efficiency and cost effectiveness, and there um, that really covers a lot of ground, especially also digitalization of healthcare, governance of healthcare system and sustainability. And I'm very, very happy, uh, Nick, that you also mentioned really the, the overall outcome. Therefore, um, the fiscal sustainability, economic sustainability, as this really very well fits into the European semester. And then let me just very briefly underline one of the features, I mean, one of, of, of the unique features of the RF and this, this combination of, of not only investments, but also very much about reforms. But what we have seen is that uh, it's not only about higher spending, but it's very much about reform of the healthcare system in order to achieve these objectives. And I stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Lots to come back to. And I just wanted to pick up and, and also you mentioned digitalization, so on lots of detail in the report on those sorts of issues. But I wanted to come back uh, to this point you said about the recovery plan, the recovery and resilience facility, as we love to call it in Brussels, the RFF, uh, RRF. Um, and you said it's one of the most important issues to be tackled and you pointed it. Eugene, do you see this as a moment of opportunity in, in two senses? Uh, one, uh, in the sense of COVID, as you said, and as Nick has underlined, has underlined to us all how important this link is, health and wealth. Um, but also there's this resource, maybe a one-off opportunity to use this huge resource. Is this a moment of opportunity? And if it is, how do we best seize it? Uh, Jackie, good question. And I just want to say, I sort of agree with what Stanim and Johannes was saying. I mean, 
you know, from my perspective, I guess, um, you know, I don't think there's one example model to follow, to be quite honest with you, to, to narrow the gap. I think FBI has investigated, um, you know, the root cause of unavailability and found there to be 10 interrelated factors. You know, this range from slow regulatory process, late in the initiation of uh, market access, nuclear duplicative, uh, you know, evidence requirements and things like that. So I think, you know, for, for me, if I can sort of state at very high level, I think that the key challenge to me is the multifactorial aspect mm -hmm. of the challenge. And hence why I think this can only be solved by different stakeholders working together. I know that sounds kind of like a, a basic statement, but it, it, it's very important that, that those stakeholders come together to design the solutions because everyone is codependent on others and there's many facets. So I don't want to come across here to say, you know, this is this is a problem, but I see that as the key challenge. I don't know if that mm -hmm. makes sense to you, but absolutely, absolutely does. And how do you bring them together? And that may be links to what Stanomir said earlier mm -hmm. about a lack of know-how, a lack of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just about the money, although as you've underlined, Nick, uh, you can't use one argument, the lack of efficiency or effectiveness as an argument you say uh, for the lack of investment but in terms of this moment of opportunity Nick um Johanna's saying everyone's got work to do COVID has showed every member state has some homework but these countries particularly dramatic do you think we need to do more in terms of the awareness of that link between health and wealth uh, even though it's already been underlined by COVID do we need more to convince people that as you said uh healthcare is an investment not a cost so I think um you rightly pointed out that COVID-19 has really already raised the awareness of the importance of resilient healthcare systems, and that's a great platform to build off. Um, I think what needs to be done now, though, is to take that argument and make it more um, understandable to those outside of, say, Ministry of Health context. A lot of the arguments in the past have been presented to the Ministry of Health or equivalent roles, and they're champions of the cause already. It's being able to present these arguments to ministries of finance and, and those who are making trade-offs between investment in healthcare and other parts of the um, government spend portfolio. And, and that is that is the challenge because it's, as Stanimir pointed out, there's a capability gap sometimes in terms of the ability to manage a healthcare and portfolio of investments. So the, the trust, so the awareness is now there in the public um, debate but the precision of the argument now needs to be refined and made impactful, as well as the capabilities of those managing those budgets to earn the trust to be able to deal with more investment. I'm going to bring Stanimir in and then Eugene. Stanimir. Yeah, uh, I would agree with, with all that and I put another aspect here. Uh, government at the end, uh, they really need some guidance on, on what to do in the right way. And usually what they receive here as an answer from ministers of um, finance or even the prime ministers uh, are, okay, we know we are not spending enough on health, but nobody's telling us from where and how to cut the other sectors in order to uh, increase uh, in investment in, in, in healthcare. And I think this is a major, major argument and, uh, which I don't have an answer. And most likely here we need some coordination, some guidance Does on that. that, mean, How it, that uh, argument that it's an investment and there are longer term cost savings that can be used uh, for other services, that's not really cutting through. They're saying we don't have the money now. What do you want us to exactly. do? Exactly. I think everyone is convinced, uh, especially after COVID, that uh, investment in, in, in health is needed and uh, that this is a major uh, issue uh, here uh, leading to lots of economic uh, uh, consequences after COVID uh, and, and everything else. The bigger problem is how we restructure our internal budgets and they ask me whether we should uh, stop from, from education uh, uh, to cut the money from there or cut the money from military uh, gotcha. and uh, NATO or what, what shall we do if you were in our shoes? Quick one if you would Eugene because I want to bring Johannes in. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Stanimir and Jackie, I mean, just kind of build on what you've just said. And I think the comment I wanted to make was, is that sort of return on investment mindset, I think that that that, that is missing, because, you know, exactly to what Nick said, you know, this is not a cost, this is an investment. So we have to think long term. And Stanimir, to your point, you know, where, okay, where do we get this money from? But, you know, using an old saying, you know, best bang for your buck, you know, what gives you the best return? And I think the report that Nick's and PwC has done, it shows you there's a good return on investment. And that's the kind of, I guess, just mindset and mentality perhaps that we need to start looking at. 
Thank you. And, and Johannes, that brings me to what I wanted to ask you in terms of you've talked about um, the recovery and resilience facility and you've talked about its reforms as well as investments. But more broadly, there is, of course, also a you when it comes to budget discipline and so on. How you look at social spending more broadly, how you look at social welfare. So do you see social spending? Do you see health spending as a cost or as an investment? And how does that affect debates about budget discipline and so on. How is that argument now uh, and in the context of, of RRF being played out? I mean, the, uh, you're of course completely right, but I think this, this um, <laughs> to say that um, just higher spending is an investment and this is good. I think this is a bit too simple. Yeah. And also looking at, uh, at the PwC report, I don't think that you can take it from there. Um, and for that, I think we would have to go um, into into significant more detail. And um, as we have done it, I mean, the the you very well know that the EU's competence um, with regard to healthcare is very limited, um, and in a way uh, also justified. I mean, what we have to deal with are national healthcare systems, and that's what we have been looking under the RIF in order to improve it. And together, of course, with the, with the member states um, in, in, in very close dialogue with the member states and what can be done. And um, the, there, if we are looking at the spending under the, under the RF, it's, I mean, and, and it's just a ballpark figure after, after for the submitted plans. Therefore, if I think it was 24 submitted plans. This was roughly around uh, 50 billion, which are being spent on healthcare, therefore quite a significant amount. Um, on average, is uh, it's 14% it's, it's of the plans, and it reaches up to 30% of the plans. And I think I've got, I mean, that was from the already adopted plans, therefore those um, where the council has adopted the, the, the council implementing decision with regard to the plans. Uh, this goes up to 30% for Estonia and, and I think Slovenia, uh, roughly 20% for Slovakia and Romania, therefore uh, also the countries uh, which we are talking about today. And um, other countries, and you also have to bear in mind that, for example, for Luxembourg, the, 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 the plan uh, only makes up for, let's say, for a small, much smaller portion of the GDP than for, for countries like Croatia or other countries. Uh, there, of course, it's much, much, much less, but also the plans are covering much, much, much less. And um, here we really have a tailor-made package for the, for the uh, different member states um, of reforms and investments. And um, looking at the reforms, um, I would like to highlight Slovenia where we have uh, quite a number of, of reforms in the sector, therefore uh, really an encompassing healthcare reform, a very um, encompassing uh, long-term care reform uh, for, for a social security um, section, which doesn't exi exist up to now and therefore which will be introduced. Um, and that, of course, then coupled with the investments and, and I think I already mentioned um, quite a number of them, Absolutely. But let me let me just highlight again the importance of digitalization. More than half of the member states really have put digitalization of the healthcare system into the focus, and in a way both. Therefore, to improve the efficiency of the healthcare system, but also to improve the accessibility in terms of patient communication and so on. Thank you. So Slovenia, they're showing what can be done. Nick, very briefly, because then I want to delve into some of the detail. We've got questions already about access to innovative medicines and so on, and the role of industry. But in terms, just very briefly, of Stanimir's, what Stanimir says, people say, yeah, fine, we accept what you're saying. Where do you want us to find this money? Do we take it from education? Do we take it? How do you answer that? Well, I don't want to make a recommendation on where you should be taking <laughs> money away from and putting it into healthcare, I think uh, I wouldn't be the right person to make that. Is that a false choice, that. I think, is the question I'm asking. I think at the moment, the role that those, you know, those experts within healthcare can do is make a strong argument as to why it's a good investment to be putting money into healthcare. I think ministries of finance then need to make their decisions based on the arguments they're getting from other sectors. Um, so I think mm -hmm. that's probably the more appropriate focus on Absolutely. that sort of question. 
and Eugene, a specific question to this as well from Rudiger Schultzer in our audience. We're missing something if we just issue a call to action to governments to invest more. What about our role as an industry? Have we done our part and invested adequately in Central and Eastern Europe? Yeah, I think I would go back to my earlier comment. I think, as I said before, there are many stakeholders involved, involved in this. So I think it's not just uh, upon industry. And I think uh, the critical thing for me is that we need to get around the table and have those discussions uh, to come up with a solution. That would be my comment on that. Thank you. Let's delve into some of, of these questions. We talked about efficiency and effectiveness. We have a question from our audience about access to modern mm -hmm. therapies. Uh, Nicolas Zidias, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, says, I appreciate the positive intention and inclusive approach of the European Commission. However, the reality is that a patient in Central and Eastern Europe is able to have access, if at all, to modern therapies on average two years after a patient in Germany. How can this gap be effectively reduced with concrete action solutions and support from the Commission? How can we ensure citizens have the same right to treatment and health? And I think I'm right in saying uh, that only 34% uh, um, of new drugs authorised by the European Medicines Agency are available in, in Central Eastern European countries. And Nick, the report says uh, they have access to half as many medicines and they wait a lot longer as the questioner indicates. A, a point to why this is what we need to do in this area. There's, there's a number of different um, things you can do. I, I think a couple of um, sort of opportunities, real tr true and effective use of um, cost effectiveness assessments. Um, there's, you know, that's a capability that's becoming more mature, especially within sort of developed sort of Western EU5 markets, for instance, but it, in, it's applied inconsistently in Central and Eastern European countries and, and often, you know, decisions revert back to budget. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole point around cost of use of cost effectiveness is to show that spending on innovative medicines that have been deemed to be cost effective is, in a, is a cost effective use of money. Um, but often decisions revert back to a budget. So I think um, there is a sort of more appropriate and consistent use of that. The other thing is horizon scanning, um, being able to allocate budget and plan effectively in the future when you know that there is innovation coming through the pipeline. Um, so we're seeing enormous innovation within oncology, Alzheimer's disease, um, so, so chronic diseases and diabetes, for instance. There is, this innovation is coming through and it, you need to plan to budget for these. Um, you can't, they can't arrive and suddenly be spent on. So collaboration needs to work there between industry and, and governments to be able to to be able to be prepared for that spending. And that point you make in the report about moving from short-term action to long-term planning. Stanimir, from a patient perspective, this must be one of the biggest frustrations. It is, it is, it doesn't make sense for any patient around Europe, especially those living in CE, that Europe is putting lots of efforts to have a unified process of, uh, um, of registering medicines and uh, uh, through the, the European Medicines Agency. And afterwards, we have fragmented system for decisions that can take uh, two and sometimes even more years uh, for local governments to decide on reimbursement. What's clear from the very beginning that many of those medicines are needed and there's huge unmet need for patients. And from a medical point of view, they provide innovation to patients. And I really don't, don't see um, any, uh, any rational uh, reason why every single member state would have to go through a process of HTA. And I don't know what that is used just to prolong uh, um, the period for that. What's more, we see more and more companies, and this is something to our friends from Ipia to, to, to answer, but we see more and more companies that are simply delaying the launches of the products once, um, once approved by uh, the European Medicines Agency, but they are simply uh, postponing the launches of these new medicines in many of the markets there. So what kind of single market do we have in Europe when we talk about medicines, since it's highly regulated? It's, uh, and uh, last but not least, can we expect that countries which have 10 times lower GDP in, uh, uh, than uh, the uh, EU4 or EU5 uh, uh, countries quoting uh, this morning, can we expect that these countries would pay exactly the same price for a medicine mm. since they're 10 times poorer? And where's the European solidarity on that? And can we do something 
on European level, so we can have more more fair uh, a market of medicines, so we can allow those member states to assure um, timely access to innovation for their citizens on an acceptable, according to their economic situation, price. Absolutely, Eugene. I'll give you a chance to respond on that company question, moment, but I want to bring Johannes in here. And there is a question. Please do react on this debate on innovative medicines, but there's also a, a question about the spending mix because Elena Leontieva says, "Where do the top five?" countries put less money to put more into healthcare. Well, she's actually talking about the allocation between different budgets. Uh, but I wanted to ask you more about where the money is spent. Uh, primary care, secondary care, prevention, more on, on those sort of things. Do you think we need to pay more attention, not just to how much uh, and not just to, to uh, broad questions of healthcare spending, but, but the targeting of that spending and where it needs to go? Is that an issue, Johannes, that when you're looking at people's um, under, under the recovery plan, you're looking at where they want to spend it, not just what they want to spend. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think that was that was one of the main areas of discussion also with the member states. And um, I said at the beginning, it's, it's, it's roughly about 50 billion, which is being spent. And most of the money um, go on the one hand to, to primary care and prevention. And uh, we have seen that in quite a number of, and, and I think it also clearly came out of uh, the PwC report, um, that um, this is an area where especially also the CE countries um, have some deficits and therefore moving it away um, or supporting primary care and, and, and prevention and outpatient care. Um, then we have another area is long-term care. This is about um, three to five billion. Um, then, of course, we also have some hospital modernization, and there we have, a, let's say, clusters in, in, in certain member states, if I recall correctly, and I may be wrong, it was Estonia, but for example, also in, in Germany, we have a big, big um, hospital modernization program, which also goes into the area of digitalization. This is roughly between 14 and 18 billion, and then 7 to 10 billion is, is, is really digital health. Um, therefore, the digitalization of the healthcare system. And then let me just underline one issue which we have seen in, in uh, nearly all the member states, and this is the shortage of healthcare workers, and therefore the shortage of human skills. Mm. And um, what we have seen there uh, in quite a number of member states is, is training, therefore better training uh, and uh, compensation of qualified medical personnel. And therefore also there, I think the, I mean, looking at the overall budget and, and Stanimir, you said really take it away from other fields, uh, give it to healthcare. I think that was quite some, some discussion also in the, in the area of the RF, really the question how to, how to deal with that. And of course, the, um, uh, just raising the, the, the salaries of, of healthcare workers, this has not been or is not eligible as costs under the RRF, but really what the RRF is looking at is, is really investment. And this is really to improve the capital stock or the human skills stock um, or reforms uh, and therefore not, not um, uh, expenditure, which really lead to ongoing um, ongoing expenditure also after the end of the lifetime of the RF, therefore after 2026, because uh, in the end, what we want to ensure is also sustainability of public finances. Thank you very much. Um, Eugene, a word to these two issues, one on the uh, innovative access to innovative medicines. Just want to read out from Kathleen, Kathleen Grieve. If the EU pharma strategy is approved with the equitable access to all countries at the same time, how do we manage the difference between market access and patient access when healthcare systems cannot cope with innovative medicines and associated companion diagnostics? Just want to throw that into the mix. Stanimir said companies delaying launching products. So word to that. And then if you would also on the spending mix. That's a load. So anyway, so um, again, I want to go back, I, you know, this study, of course, that, that, that PwC did, I think it focuses on innovative medicines. But, you know, the fact is, it's a whole system that needs to be improved. You know, we can recently, you know, there's been demonstrations in Poland 
as you all know about the salaries of HEPs, and we know there are large discrepancies there as well. So for me to have a solid healthcare system delivering high quality care to patients, you know, you need HEPs, you need the infrastructure and the equipment as well as the medicines to go with it. So again, I wanna go back, it's interrelated, you know, this falls, uh, I think why FBI is also calling for the organization of a high level forum with all stakeholders involved to really, you know, discuss this and try to come up with solutions. I think it's, you know, just focusing on that isn't necessarily, you know, the, the only problem. And then in terms of the access issue, I mean, there's, you know, there's lots, again, I don't just want to throw words out there, but there's lots of factors involved around the process, the reimbursement criteria, the health system readiness, tons of stuff that's involved. And I think FBA even did the report around that 10 interrelated factors. There was everyday count report. So it's not just about that. It's, uh, you know, I think Sanima, you touched on it, you know, different evidence requirement across Europe, you know, lack of clarity of national requirements, evidence gaps, you know, misalignment of value and price. I mean, it, you know, it, it, there's a lot of issues there. And again, that's why we need to get around the table and, and discuss this. So my response to that. Thank you very much. Nick, your reaction to the, the debate and the comments that have been made about access uh, to innovation, uh, but also if you could to the issue of the spending mix, because I know the report talks about a better integration of spending in the different areas, better alignment between health and social and so on. But um, how big an issue for you uh, when we go beyond the actual pot of money is uh, the discussion about what do we spend it on? Yeah, so Johannes provided a sort of quite a clear detail of where the priority focus areas were for investment. I think we did a fairly basic analysis of, of infrastructure versus human resources. And we looked at, for instance, the number of hospital beds per capita in Central and Eastern European countries per EU5. And interestingly, almost all of the Central and Eastern European countries have more hospital beds per capita than um, EU5 countries. Now they may not be modernized, and hence the need for reforms in that section. But point being is that infrastructure is not so bad, but if you don't have doctors and nurses to run those, you know, to be able to support the, the operations of the hospital, especially in an acute setting in, in a COVID-19 pandemic, it, you really see that the difference in how having infrastructure is not the solution. And then of course, we've seen that um, in the same analysis that these same CE countries have less doctors and nurses than the EU5 counterparts. So the answer is not necessarily building infrastructure to deal with acute sort of pandemic settings, but to, to build a more resilient healthcare system. Now that does lead to seeing more community-based care, more primary care setting, integrations of primary and secondary care budgets to be able to manage the, the flow of patients from secondary care into primary care. Thank you. Um, just a warning to Magdalena Konoska, I'm going to come to you in a moment, so if you could be ready to activate your mic, but Stanimir, you wanted to come in here. Yes, I wanted to comment on, uh, on the issue of uh, number of doctors, hospitals, etc. Bulgaria is exception again here. Um, we have high number of doctors, or at least higher than the average. We have high number of hospitals, higher than the average in Europe and still the poorest results. So it's not only about how many doctors you have, it's also about how you train those doctors and how you prepare them for the system and whether the system is following certain standards, certain uh, guidelines. And, and, and here there's huge space for improvement on European level. We constantly say it's competence of member states, it's competence of member states, but I think this is a good excuse for not taking actions, let's say in the medical training. We can have at least better standards and understandings and, and an alignment between different countries on um, what the medical training is and uh, what is the quality med medical training, what are the qualities and the standards and the guidelines in different specialties and how we make sure that every European doctor would follow um, similar procedures and uh, every patient at the end would have similar way of receiving um, the services and the quality of those services um, to be guaranteed for. I think these are the important conversations that we need to have in the future, not so much on number of doctors, number of hospitals, but how we make sure that what we have uh, actually works and, and provides health in uh, uh, the way that is evidence-based. 
So you talked at the beginning about a lack of coordination. I want to come back on your point about solidarity later. But Johannes, before I go out to the floor, uh, I've, I've heard this argument said many times before that sometimes a feeling that the EU institutions, the Commission, hides behind the competence argument uh, to say this is just too difficult. You do it. And whereas Stanley is saying there are things, and I think you're showing through the RRF and the process of scrutiny you're going through, just how much of an influence you can have. I mean, yes, in this area, because if you want the money, you have to do it. But just do you think there is a validity to that argument? Sometimes we hide behind competition and, and the EU actually can do a lot more. Um, I mean, I'm, of course, talking here from Brussels and therefore of course uh, you I indeed, very indeed. much like the EU and I very much like the Commission. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, but uh, also from the Commission side and from the EU side, we really have to respect member states' competences, and otherwise we are really getting into trouble, and we won't be able to achieve anything. So then we have the RF, and the RF is of course put into the framework of the European Semester. And I started off with saying that um, we have issued quite a number of of, of country-specific recommendations within the European Semester uh, for the different member states, and we really. Uh, uh, Stanmir, I, um, I, I even may agree with you on the outcome, but we really have to start with the member states, where we have national health system, where we really have to see what is going on on the ground in the member states, and where we have to take the situation as it is and can't really project it into an ideal outcome in the end. And therefore, um, what we have been doing in the European semester is, is really looking at the, the situation on the ground in the member states and seeing what can be um, achieved, what has to be improved. And uh, that's what we have been taking as the starting point uh, for the RF. And of course, uh, Jackie, you're completely right. I mean, the good thing about the RF is that there's money behind and that the um, country-specific recommendations um, more or less for the first time are not only um, just some recommendation um, uh, issued here in Brussels, but uh, lead to a very, very um, close cooperation and intensive dialogue with the member states. So again, a real opportunity here. Really an opportunity. Use this for, for structural and, reforms. And, and let me just say that um, the, the, you are saying the, the, the quality of the doctors should be improved, for example, also in Bulgaria. Um, and we have had uh, these, these discussions, especially with regard to the push to primary care and to outpatient care, which is something which is quite granular in a way. In the end, you don't have a hospital which, which, uh, which is to be opened, but really which improves the situation for the, for the European citizens in the, in the various member states. And for that, really, we had good discussions with the member states, but it was also quite some lengthy process. I'm going to bring Eugene in a minute, but a very yeah. quick one, if you would, Johannes, because it links to what you were just saying. Amalia Mihai asks, does the Commission have a, pro have a project of recommendation for minimum healthcare investment spending amounts for Central and Eastern European countries? That's not something you would get into, is it? No, no. And uh, I mean, this is not, uh, this is in a way uh, also not what we are tasked with. And exactly. I mean, the, the European yeah. semester is about really um, improving the economic, social um, and employment situation. And, and we are not, uh, let's say, uh, then diverting Indeed not. from, Thank from you. education somewhere else. Just to clear that up, Eugene, you want yeah. to come in. No, I just, I just thank you, uh, Jackie. I just want to quickly uh, comment on the mix because you had to ask and I didn't yeah. respond back to that. So I think, uh, you know, pretty much what everybody has said, for me, the key around the mix is, I mean, it's quite a difficult one, but I think it should be driven by the value brought to the patient, you know, because it will be different in each sort of local context, right? And then kind of stating the obvious, you know, we sometimes see the percentage, for example, let's a, take a mix as, you know, pharmaceutical expend. You see that as a high percentage in the CEE versus, for example, the, the West and, and, and the rationale for that is because, as I just stated earlier, you know, for example, HEP costs or salaries are much higher in West than it is in Europe. So therefore, the percentage looks like it's lower, you know, uh, in the EU5, for example, versus, uh, you know, CEE. So I think if you still look on a per capita basis, you know, it's much lower in the CEE. So I think that the, the mix, I just want to put that context because it's quite a hard thing to, to, to answer, but it boils down to return of investment and what is the value that you can bring to patients and we have to put it in that context. Thank you. Just want to give the floor to Magdalena Konarska. If you can activate your mic, uh, Magdalena, I have now uh, allowed you to open it. Are you there? Magdalena, can you hear me? If not, your mic is still off. Um, if you could unmute yourself. Otherwise, I'll come back to you 
Uh, if I can, I'll try and squeeze you in before the end. Um, before we try and identify um, priorities for the future, I just wanted to come back. Stanley me talked at the beginning about a lack of coordination, a lack of solidarity in healthcare. Uh, you also talked earlier about the role of industry in some areas and so on. I wanted to ask you all what you want from each other. Uh, and I'll leave Nick last, because he's sort of, um, you know, from the study and see what, who, what you think different people need to do. And I, I asked this question really because Eugene said at the beginning, and he said again recently, you know, it's about working together. It's about multi, it's so multifaceted. That's the biggest challenge. But Stanimir, what do you want? from Johannes or Johannes's colleagues what do you want from Eugene and what do you think you as a patient organization can do that's a good question but uh, actually I want from uh, most of them to be much more brave and uh, we're in times right now when we can afford to be a bit more brave in uh, how we provide policies how we make policies in those countries and how we engage with those countries uh, and the COVID gives us fantastic opportunity to do that on top of uh, uh, the fantastic funding opportunities that we, we saw if we make better link between the funding and the structural reforms that those countries are planning and doing then I think the effectiveness of investment would increase dramatically and the know-how could potentially um, transfer easily to, to, to those countries. This is the time to do it. And, and your uh, own goal um, in terms of influencing the debate then on not just the amount of money, but how it's spent? Well, this is the, the, the issue. Um, those countries are receiving money. And again, if you look into Bulgaria, which I'm not sure has a finalized plan yet, but uh, uh, the healthcare uh, is um, narrowed down to, uh, to, to simple interventions that uh, go to buying, um, um, to buying some equipment for hospitals without any uh, really plan for how this is going to um, become a more structural, more long-term uh, reforms and intervention. And here, here I see the role of the Commission and the other member states um, when you see uh, such uh, um, proposals to, to guide the countries and probably help them have better uh, recovery and resilience plans and use better the money that uh, they need. And I'm sure they're putting efforts on that, but maybe from the point of view of citizen living here, we expect more. And luckily here, the citizens are very pro-Euro. <laughs> they continue to think that uh, uh, Europe has a role to play here with the local governments. Thank you. Johannes, you wanted to come in. Anemia, may I ask you a question? And it may be a bit blunt, but um, of course the first responsibility is with the Bulgarian people. And therefore Absolutely. what I wanted to ask you is, um, and, and uh, I've been, uh, let's say, dealing with, with Bulgaria a lot in the last years in, 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 in various sectors. Really, how can you make sure that the Bulgarian government is in a way following the advice which you are giving? And I mean, from Brussels, we are always a bit distant, a bit far away and really giving, giving advice how this should be done on the ground is always a bit difficult. But the Bulgarian citizens are the ones who are impacted. How do you do that? How, what, what can you do in order to make sure that really um, the government is listening to you? Well, being honest, uh, citizens here are quite active because they don't have any other choice when you have governments changing every three months. So uh, citizens have to be strong at the end. But uh, I think what could be really much more effective is to have better link between the funding coming from Brussels, which still counts in those countries, and many of those countries have bigger percentage of their GDP coming actually from EU funds. And this is uh, uh, something that we have to acknowledge. EU has a tool that has to be used much better and stronger to support those member states to go uh, through the reforms needed. And I think uh, holding the budgets and, and, and the money that they desperately need uh, in, in many of the cases and better channeling that uh, to interventions that are based on evidences and what we already know okay. is working in Europe, why shouldn't it work in Bulgaria? And I think making this link much stronger with the funding, the money and the way they are spent uh, uh, wouldn't uh, make member states angry. On the opposite, it will help okay. them to make the right choices. Thank you. Eugene, uh, question to you in terms of what do you want 
What do you yeah. want most? We talked about a lot of issues from Johannes, uh, from policymakers. What do you want from patient organisations? Because mm. you've talked about the importance of bringing everyone yeah. together. How do you see their role and your role in all of this? No, I agree. I can't stress it more. I think, you know, indeed, of course, we are ready to sit down, you know, something like at a high level forum, because we clearly don't have, you know, there's no single reply here that can come up with the answer. So I realise you know, this is a change maybe uh, compared to how we did it in the past, but also I think COVID-19 has now significantly changed that. And just going back to, to Nick's report, you know, that report describes to me how there's a relationship between the environment and the strategic behavior of the industry. So I think, you know, uh, it's important uh, for, you know, and of course that environment around, uh, you know, regulatory requirements, pricing reimbursement processes, you know, all affects commercial decisions. So I think we're ready to sit down to find a solution to it, but we've got to work together there's no i see no other way of doing it and also perhaps foster that understanding of what drives your decisions and how they're impacted uh nick a, rea a brief reaction as we would and i don't know whether you can comment because it's not in the scope of the study um but briefly and then i want to draw some conclusions stiepian orekovic i hope i pronounced that vaguely correctly uh asked why the three top ranked healthcare systems in the world from uh, uh, europe France, Sweden, and Italy are not delivering in terms of control of COVID mortality rates. What does this tell us about system society health determinants and what would be the message for future? Out of the scope of the report, but I don't know whether very briefly we have any insights into what's happened there because it is a significant, when we talk about COVID being a moment of opportunity, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I look, I think um, a lot of the COVID-19 response extended beyond health, management of healthcare systems. There was a lot of politics involved, you know, to lock down economies is not necessarily a healthcare system driven decision. So I think the timing of some of those lockdowns, decisions that are made at, you know, the prime minister level really contribute to some of the results we're seeing in relation to COVID-19. So it, yes, there's a correlation and the studies have been published from the European Commission around the resilience of healthcare systems and how that contributes to their Absolutely. preparedness. But it's to a much it. bigger a much bigger set of factors okay we are almost out of time and i want to pick up on something diana dimitrova from our audience asked but i'm going to refine it a bit she asks which would be the three highest priority first steps you'd propose to start closing the east-west healthcare investment gap i'm going to make it even more difficult uh, and i'd ask each of you to identify just one what is the most important step of all the issues we've discussed and need to be addressed what is the most important step from your perspective? One minute each. I'm going to go Stanimir, Johannes, Nick, and give Eugene the last word. Stanimir. For me, I would like to say uh, to see more European health, as many of the European citizens are calling, and this is not CE, uh, ask and question. And I'm sure that the politicians would find a way. It's time, really, to coordinate better. It's time to, uh, uh, to uh, take the best evidence-based solutions. It's time to unify many of our systems, standards. It's time to learn from each other and stop really talking about competences, but talking about actions that count for citizens. Thank you very much indeed. Johannes. Uh, I think for me, it's easy. I mean, the um, RIF is, is still on paper. The RPs have been adopted, but now we have six years of implementation and six years of implementation for reforms and investments and all of that um, and will really depend on the on the ownership of the of the member states without the member states um, there will not be um, there will not be a proper implementation therefore they also want to wish to implement all of that and um, uh, the member states are uh, one point but of course uh, and i have heard a lot about cooperation between the different actors and this will also be crucial for the implementation of the RF. And therefore, I very much welcome. I mean, um, I think I would put the focus a bit different than, um, than really the study. And you, Eugene, um, as you are very much focused on, 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 on medicines, I mean, I would put it in a more holistic sense uh, for the healthcare system. But I very much agree with all of you that um, uh, in order to change it, but also in order to implement the RIF, a lot of cooperation will be needed. And therefore I welcome very much your, your contribution to the whole debate and the contribution to the, to the, to the implementation of the RIF. And I very much hope uh, that we can really meet again in the future in order then to see how this is really ongoing. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, so I think spending needs to be long-term. 
needs to be not just the increase in spending, but what it's spent on within that mix um, in terms of a focus on the reforms. And that needs to extend beyond political cycles um, to ensure that long-term investment. And, and as Stanamir used the word brave before, it's going to take an element of courage to make those continued investments that extend for an extended period of time. Thank you very much. Eugene, you have the last word. Oh, thank you. No, uh, again, all I want to reiterate, you know, we're talking about one system where each stakeholder is codependent on one another. You know, and the most important priority for us at this point is our patients' needs. So I would, from my perspective, I think key for me, you know, encourage that we conduct this conversation with all key stakeholders that play a role in the healthcare system. You know, during, for example, a high-level forum, lay the issues on the table and let's try to confront and come, you know, get together to, to derive a solution. I mean, there's, there's no any other way for me. So that's the way I see thank it. Thank you very much. And I think general agreement on that. So thank you for a very harmonious uh, end to our discussion. Uh, thank you. We've covered a lot of ground, very short space of time. Uh, thank you to you all. Thank you to FK for hosting us. Thank you, Nick and PwC for the fascinating study. And thank you to all of you for joining us and for your comments and your questions. Uh, it only remains for me to wish you all a very pleasant rest of the day. Have a good week. Thank you, panel. Great discussion. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.